Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and with me is Fran Arbaugh, who's a professor of mathematics education in the Department of Curriculum Instruction at Penn State University. Fran, thanks so much for speaking with us. Oh, hi, Sam. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this study. Yeah, I'm excited about this study because we're both involved in methods courses for pre-service teachers, and it Mm -hmm. gives quite a bit to think about and where we're kind of moving them and how we're, we're guiding them on their journey to becoming mathematics teachers. The article that Fran's talking about is uh, Investigating Secondary Mathematics Pre-Service Teacher's Instructional Vision, Learning to Teach Through Pedagogies of Practice. And that's in the Journal of Teacher Education, and it was written with Dwayne Grace, Ben Freeburn, and Nursen Koenig. And Fran, so I want to start with that methods course. So this study is rooted in a methods course with pre-service teachers, and we kind of get to follow them from the start of the semester to the end of the methods course and follow their journey a bit. But first, set the stage for us. What's this methods course like? And tell us about how pedagogies of practice plays into that methods course. So I want to give a little nod to Ben Freeburn, who in the summer of 2013 came to me and said, I've been reading about these pedagogies of practice, and I think we ought to try to implement them in the methods course. So we spent the summer planning the methods course. So it's a, it was a revision of what I had been doing. And we wanted to incorporate as many approximations of practice, representations of practice, and decompositions of practice as we could in the methods course. So we redesigned it to include representations of practice like narrative cases, the students analyzed audio recordings of my teaching. They analyzed their own video recordings of their rehearsals. These are all representations of practice. They had an audio recording of a problem-solving session that they analyzed, and then we analyzed student work samples. So those all represent some kind of teaching practice or something that happens in a teaching practice. And we did several approximations of practice, which are parts of practice that approximate what happens in the classroom. People are familiar with things like peer teaching, lesson planning in a methods course is an approximation of practice. So we analyze student work examples, as I said before, because teachers analyze student work all the time. Uh, We planned for instruction. We ran rehearsals. We modeled those after the work of Magdalene Lampert and her colleagues. And in fact, we did complete cycles of enactment and investigation. Um, You can read more about that in the paper. We also um, were able to actually enact a problem solving session with the small groups of secondary students. So while this methods course didn't have a field component, one day we met at a school and were able to do that. And then we had actually just had one decomposition of practice that we focused on. And that's asking, assessing and advancing questions and using judicious telling. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's an article that Ben and I wrote in Mathematics Teacher from Mm -hmm. 2017 that has those details in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And this too is, I think you had 17 pre-service teachers in the study. Yeah. And then this methods course was a sort of a typical semester. So it's like 15 weeks that we're talking about, right? And you meet them right. meet them twice a week. So that's actually very similar to the the style that we have for our methods courses here at Mizzou as well. Yeah, it was, a, it was the first methods course of a two methods course sequence. So before this, they had not engaged in any kind of thinking about what mathematics teaching is is typically taken after their entrance to major in their junior year. So they come in really with only the knowledge that they've built about teaching from being a student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that goes into the idea of instructional vision. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, so in this article, you know, you're doing all those interesting things. You're engaging them in a lot of different pedagogies of practice um, and reflection on that. In this article, you focus on their instructional vision and you sort of Mm -hmm. look at it from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. So tell us a little bit about why you focused on instructional vision and how you thought about it for this study. Sure. So we did a really wide data collection swath for this particular section of the methods course. 
our overall guiding question was what happens when we enact a methods course that is modeled through pedagogies of practice? So we collected reading journals. We did an interview at the beginning and the end. We audio recorded every class. We video recorded every rehearsal. There was just a ton of data. And so we did not set out to study vision. But as we were post the course, as we were reading through our data, we started reading pre-service teacher one's data all the way through, pre-service two teacher's data all the way through. We were doing that and we were having discussions about how they talked about teaching and themselves as teachers and what teachers do to support student learning was really changing over the course of the semester. And we wanted a systematic way of being able to analyze and describe that. So we went looking for frameworks that would allow us to characterize how their talking and writing about teaching had changed over the semester. And we came across Chuck Munter's 2014 article about visions of high quality mathematics instruction. So we thought that had some viability. Ben and Duane went over to the University of Pittsburgh. Chuck was at the University of Pittsburgh at the time and talked to him. So we undertook an analysis using his rubrics. We analyzed all those data across all four rubrics of Chuck's framework role of teacher, classroom discussion, mathematical tasks, and student engagement. And what we realized through that analysis is, A, we had the richest data in the role of teacher rubric. Mm -hmm. And that rubric really was what we were wanting to analyze the changes in. So that's why we just chose one rubric to focus on. And we chose the role of teacher rubric. Yeah. And there clearly was enough from that rubric for an article le yes. level of analysis. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you just can tell us a little bit more about, so you had a lot of data, but just tell us a little bit more about the data that you did hone in on that becomes the central part of this article. And then just a little bit more about the way that you use that rubric um, or what you applied it to for sort of beginning of the semester, end of the semester. So as I said before, we did an interview during the first two weeks of the semester uh, where we talked to them about, you know, how do you see yourself as a teacher? What do you think is important about teaching mathematics? Describe what happens in a typical day. But then we also felt that there were some reading journals that towards the beginning of the semester, and when I say reading journals, in my practice, I have pre-service teachers read something and then they respond to prompts in their reading journals. So we had them, we looked at two reading journals. One was uh, in response to reading chapter four of adding it up. So about the strands of mathematical proficiency and reading journal two was about three different readings. We had them read Chapter one of NCTM's 2000 Principles and Standards for School Mathematics. We had them read a chapter written by Hebert and Wern about learning mathematics through problem solving. And we had them read a publication by NCTM, the first chapter of Focus in High School Mathematics, Reasoning and Sense Making, which was published in 2009. So we had those data to analyze. We also analyzed recordings of class four whole group discussions, which was a debriefing about everything that they had written and read so far in the semester. So the big messages that were coming out of the readings. We analyzed their final paper where they used qualitative analysis software to analyze recordings of their problem solving session with those students in terms of asking assessing questions, asking advancing questions, and using judicious telling. And there were a series of prompts that they had to respond to. And then we analyzed an audio recording 
from class 26 of small group analysis sessions. So in groups of three or four, the pre-service teachers use qualitative analysis software to analyze each of their audio recording of a teaching episode that happened during rehearsal. Wow. So using lots of approximations of practice, lots of representations of approximations of practice to analyze throughout the semester. And then we had a final interview where we asked them to reflect back across the semester and what they had learned and what had been impactful for their learning. Mm -hmm. And also revisiting that question of what would a math lesson look like yes. or what would a day look like? So, yeah. Yeah. And then the the framework. So using the role of the teacher dimension of Munter's framework that allowed you to throughout that data to hone in on what do they view as the teacher's job? Like, what is the teacher doing when math learning and when math lessons are happening? Right. So I want to go ahead then to the beginning of the semester. So let's go to that starting place, mm -hmm. the, data, the data you mentioned for the beginning of the semester. How would you characterize this group of pre-service teachers and where their vision started in terms of the role of the teacher in mathematics? Yeah, so through our analysis, we came to describe overall. So we didn't describe, we're, we're taking them as a cohort. So overall, they saw the role of the teacher primarily as motivator deliverer of information, and monitor. So if you look at Munter's role of teacher rubric, you can see that level zero is teacher's motivator, which suggests that the teacher must first and foremost be sufficiently captivating to attract and hold students' attention. So they were very much talking about how the teacher needed to be entertaining, energizing, and capture the student's attention, that the teacher shouldn't be boring. They also described the teacher as a deliverer of knowledge, which is level one on Munter's rubric, which describes the teacher as the primary source of knowledge, focusing primarily on mathematical correctness and thoroughness of explanation. So I'm reading from his rubric right now. So they talked a lot about how important it was to give clear explanations, how important it was to be able to explain things in different ways. Yeah, when I saw that finding, it resonates with my experience here in Missouri with um, you know pre-service teachers starting out in their methods journey. Explaining is a big part of their identity of why they want to be a math teacher and also what they see as the job of a math teacher of I'm good at giving explanations when, when math makes sense to me, I can put it into words to other people, or they sometimes talk about tutoring. Like I've, I've done tutoring and I've been able to explain to others and it makes sense. It clicks. So that's yeah. a, it's a big part of it at the start is uh, this whole currency of explanatory power or explanatory skill. Yeah. And I think anybody who's taught a secondary methods course has experienced this. Uh, so I don't think this finding was particularly surprising. It was surprising to us that we couldn't find research findings in the literature that characterized pre-service teachers' visions in this way. Like at the start. Pre when they, at the yeah. start, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they also described teacher as monitor, which describes the teacher as a primary source of knowledge that stresses the importance of providing time for students to work together to try it on their own, to make sense of what the teacher has demonstrated. So it is still a demonstrate practice model of teaching that I'd like to characterize that kind of traditional teaching as that way. But some stress the importance of, you know, giving students time and class to work problems together. Yeah. And then the, the teacher's role while the students are working is not very active or it's not very nuanced. I think in Munter's term, it's not very sophisticated about what the teacher is doing during that work time. It's just right. that they're sort of overseeing it in some generic sense. They're overseeing the work time. Yeah, they're overseeing, they're explaining. They go around to small groups and they explain how to do something when a student has a question. So while the teacher is kind of active, it's in a very top-down mathematical, I have the mathematical authority kind of way. 
you know, both of us having taught for many years in methods courses like this, I just want to also say that this is just the starting place that we see pre-service teachers arrive. You know, this is the vision that they have as they come in and there's nothing wrong with this vision. This is the reality. It's based on their real experiences. It's based on their real goals and sense of what math teaching is. And to me, there's nothing wrong with these visions. It gives us things to build on. There are expl- explanations that are important in math teaching. Like you talk about judicious telling, that is a something we want in teacher's toolkits. If they are realizing that, oh, I'm monitoring student practice, that's a positive thing that we can build on. We can say like, all right, now let's get more skilled at what you monitor for and how you you know incorporate that into the next thing that you do. So I just wanted to kind of put out there, I think we're on the same page that there's nothing wrong yeah. with this as the starting place. This is just where we where they come in the door. Yeah, Sam, I, I totally agree. I think that this research really provides the field with an important documentation of, as you said, where they are when they come in, where they're likely to be when they come in. Because we had a couple outliers, I, I have to say. But overall, this is how they characterize the role of the teacher. And just as we ask teachers to understand where their students are so that they can build on mathematically on what they know and how they think, we need to do the same thing with pre-service teachers. We need to know where they are. We need to know how they're thinking about teaching so that we can help broaden that vision. Yeah. And I think the broadening is important it's not replacing their vision with a different vision because that's almost disrespectful to them. Like they're wanting to go into a career. They view it as part of the identity that they're forming. And so if you kind of say like, oh yeah, your vision is faulty, throw it away. Here's a new vision. Really that's kind of disrespectful if you just sort of put it, put it like that. But broadening is, is different. Broadening is okay. You're coming with some valid experiences. You're coming here because in some way you want to pursue this profession in the way that you see the profession. But now we can also help you broad and add some nuance and maybe add some subtle little shifts, but that still honor like what they came in with. So now, of course, you know, the article looks at the end of the semester. So I wonder if you can let us know about what broadening did take place or what additional nuances in the visions did the pre-service teachers have when you analyze the end of the semester? Sure. We had people at the end of the semester who still talked about the role of the teacher as being motivator, a deliverer of information, and a monitor. So those things lessened in emphasis. Uh, What increased in emphasis is them talking more about teacher as facilitator and teacher as more knowledgeable other. So um, level three on Munter's framework is teacher as facilitator. And that focuses on forms of reform instruction. So Munter had gone back and looked at all of the research about effective teaching and the role of the teacher from the last, prior to 2014, last decade or so. And characterize teacher as facilitator based on that review of literature. Level three is teacher as facilitator, which he describes as focusing on the forms of reform instruction without a strong conception of the accompanying functions that underlie those forms. So for example, in influencing classroom discourse, this level describes the teacher facilitating student to student talk but primarily in terms of students taking turns sharing solutions. So asking students what it was your solution and what was your solution, not making ties Mm -hmm. among them, not building. Yeah. It's kind of, it has the surface feel of rich student discourse, but then when you look at the substance of it, they didn't really get to any deeper math ideas or they weren't really, you know, pushing each other's reasoning or or forming the deeper meanings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And Munter also characterizes this as supporting a no-tell policy. So when teachers talk about stressing that students should figure out things for themselves and play a role in teaching each other, but the teacher shouldn't tell ever what to do. So those kinds of things, that's, that's what Munter means by that form 
um, accompanying functions and forms. Mm -hmm. So we also saw more evidence of the pre-service teachers writing and talking about the teacher as a more knowledgeable other. And this is the highest level on Munter's framework level four. And that describes the role of the teacher as proactively supporting students learning through co-participation. Some characteristics of that are that the teacher should purposefully intervene in classroom discussions to elicit and scaffold students' ideas. This is like the gold standard of what we want to, you know, what we want to mm -hmm. see. Um, that the teacher should support students in sharing autonomy. And that promotes a launch, explore, summarize lesson. And the role of the teacher in the summarize of kind of pulling it all together and formalizing things. Mm -hmm. And so you saw from the pre-service teachers at the end of the semester, you started to see some some hints or some glimmers of those higher levels. Yeah. And predominantly more. I mean, you know, you can read the article and it has all the statistics, but we did show significant. So we rated everything based on level mm -hmm. and we did show in the paper that for the cohort, there was a statistically significant growth in vision over the course of the semester. Now, we talked about before, and in the article, it talks about how there was not a field component built mm -hmm. into this methods course. So it was mostly on the university campus with one, one day trip that you sort of did to a school. But I'm just curious, you saw this broadening and this, this movement in vision throughout the semester. What do you think, though, if they had been in the field? Do you think that that vision would translate to the field? Do you think there'd be conflicting dilemmas that would kind of arise? Or what do you think would happen after the semester? So maybe let's take that vision on the road and see, like, just, I know this wasn't the analysis, but just while I have you here. No, that's what okay. Do, what, what do you think um, might have happened with this cohort of students if they did go to the field or if they did go beyond this methods course into the future? Well, you know, what I hope would happen is that they would take the decomposition of practice with them. And so even in a teacher demonstrate student practice kind of classroom, that when they were interacting with students, they would ask assessing questions. Tell me how you're thinking about this. And they would base advancing questions on that, what they heard, and they would use judicious telling, which typically comes after the assessing and advancing. So my hope is that they would do that. I think what the research tells us, and we have a lot of research from, from many, many years, is there's a washout effect that happens when pre-service teachers leave a program in which they're engaged in learning how to teach from a sense-making perspective but get into schools and get into classrooms and are socialized into what the dominant practice is there. So I feel like if we had had a field experience along with this methods course that I could have given them assignments to do in the field experience in which they were a little audio recorder and tried some of this out. I mean, they did approximations of practice through rehearsals and so started learning how to do that rhythm of assessing, advancing, and judicious telling. But I fear that it washed out. Mm -hmm. Well, and you were talking about some of the practices that you hope would continue. And mm -hmm. do you feel like that the vision aligning with the practice like your hope is that that would help the practices more i'm just wondering about the the movement in the vision and, and gaining some of the sophisticated levels of the vision do you think that made it more likely that those practices would carry over because maybe they see the purpose of it or they see how it's going you know a specific practice a decomposed practice do they see it as feeding into a larger vision of teaching or do you feel like you could have just emphasized the practices and the vision you know what role do you think the vision played or or does it need to be there I mean, my gut is, is they leave with this broadened vision, right? They know what can happen. Mm -hmm. Hopefully within the first five years, if they have this broadened vision, they can move towards that. 
think it's really hard for beginning teachers to kind of buck the system, mm-hmm. really. And so one of the reasons we chose assessing, advancing, and telling as our decomposition of practice is, as I said before, that can translate, mm-hmm. that can go in. Mm-hmm. The whole broadening of teacher as facilitator or teacher as more knowledgeable other, it's there. That's my reason for doing this. Mm -hmm. It's there when they want to tap into it. Mm -hmm. It's there when they feel the opportunity to tap into that kind of vision. It's there when they seek professional development opportunities to try to move towards that. Hammerness talks about instructional vision as something that teachers can aspire to, that they may never quite reach it, but they can get closer and closer and closer by learning more about practice, by trying more things out, by listening to students more. Mm -hmm. So that's my hope. I do have one example of a first year teacher who went in and just thought, this is the only way that students should be learning math. And she has, she's probably in her seventh or eighth year by now. And she has stuck with it Mm. even through COVID. And she is kind of my one, my end of one success story. (laughs) Yeah, that's definitely good to hear. Cause yeah, I have a couple of those that really bought into the vision, Mm -hmm. but then did not they're not teaching anymore because I think it is, they can feel that there's a lot of forces working in the other direction or that, yeah. that, you know, so it can, if that aspiration is pretty ambitious, but then you see the reality and there's a big disconnect that can also be disheartening, you know, and yeah. it, it can add one more thing to the pile of stress and burdens that teachers already have on them. But, yeah. But I think we have to try. I think we have to try. I mean, the, the in some way, the cycle has to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And I think it's imperative for us to do our best to try to disrupt. Yeah, I agree. For me, it's this, I'm right now working on that. How far out should that aspiration be? Mm -hmm. Should that aspiration be all the way up there at the pinnacle? Um, Mm -hmm. Or is there a sort of medium zone that's still aspirational? It still can give them something to move towards but it's not so far out that it seems unattainable or it seems, you know, too disconnected, but. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I used to educate pre-service teachers to go all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. Problem solving all the time, sense making all the time. And through my years of experience, I have pulled that back to really think about what do I want them to focus on in their first three years? Mm -hmm. That's going to make a difference to student learning. And I think their interactions with students can do that. I'm speaking with Fran Arbaugh from Penn State University. And Fran, I really appreciate digging into this article with you and just also having that broader conversation about uh, teacher education. I have a couple of questions that I like to ask all the guests to get get on the record from you. So sure. um, first of all, if we go back to your grad studies, when you got your PhD, where did you do your doc studies? And just briefly, what was the topic of your dissertation? So I got my PhD at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, many, many years ago now. And for my dissertation, I worked with a local group of high school geometry teachers and facilitated a year-long study group with them. This was at a time when study groups were just emerging as a form of professional development. So I studied what they learned about teaching through sense-making. I taught them about levels of cognitive demand. And among other things, I studied how their choice of tasks changed over the academic year. It was a really good experience for me. I had some professional development experiences when I was a high school math teacher that were pivotal in my thinking about teaching and learning doing a total 180. I started as a very traditional chalk and talk teacher. And then I met John Vandewall and studied with John Vandewall. And I became a teacher of sense making. Mm. And so when I went to do my PhD, I really wanted to engage other teachers in those kinds of experiences. 
in hopes that they would have these kinds of epiphanies and build these kinds of practices themselves. Hmm. So there is a little bit of a connection there to vision, you know, instructional vision. Mm -hmm. My last question is, if you weren't in math education, is there a career that you might imagine doing instead? That's pretty easy to answer. I am post back certified to teach mathematics. Never wanted to be a teacher. I come from a family of educators. I was going to break the mold. (laughs) My undergraduate degree from Virginia Tech is in family and child development with an option in human services. Hmm. It's like a bachelor's of social work. So I had envisioned becoming the director of a hotline or a home for battered women, Mm -hmm. doing something in the social services. I graduated at a time where the nas- the federal funding for that had been severely cut. And so there were no jobs to be had. Hmm. And so I worked in a dentist office for a year. And then I thought I need a real job. And I went back and got post back certified to teach math because I'd always been pretty good at math. Mm-hmm. So... I would envision myself doing something in the social services. Hmm. I've also come to realize that I think I would have been a pretty good nurse. So I can kind of envision myself as having an RN or a PhD in nursing if I went that far. Wow. Yeah. Well, we're, we're glad that you did end up here and and have had your math ed career. So I'm glad (laughs) we I'm a big believer in things happen for a reason, and I am where I was meant to be. Well, and I'm glad that it finally worked out that we could get together to have this conversation. So thanks so much for for speaking through the article and, and have a great semester. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Sam.